Well, once again, as I often do, I spent too much time on eBay and I ended up buying this. And funny thing is, I didn't even know what the heck this thing was. But I saw six network interfaces and a $20 price tag, and I figured I could probably turn this into a pretty decent little DIY router. And well, spoiler, I did. But installing OpenSense on this and actually getting it working took a bit more work than I was expecting. And well, that led to a fun little adventure, let's say. I found that this kind of old, odd network appliance packs some very unique features and quirks, some of which I've yet to come across on this channel. I think you guys might find this one pretty interesting, so let's get started. Okay, so what the heck is this thing? Well, you can probably tell from the sticker on the front that this is from a brand called Riverbed, and this unit specifically is the CX570, which is part of their Steelhead series of products. Riverbed Steelhead is in fact not the name of a great bluegrass band like I might have guessed, but instead it's an ecosystem of products that are designed for network acceleration. Now, I'm not going to pretend like I really understand everything that this would be doing, but basically this could be used in the business world to help optimize and speed up communication between multiple data centers, offices, or whatever else. Essentially, you would put this appliance between your LAN and your WAN, and then do the same on other networks, and then it could sort of transparently improve performance of certain traffic and applications with things like caching or TCP optimization, and other stuff that I don't really care to get into or understand because, well, that's not why I bought this thing. I bought this thing because, well, it only cost me $40 after taxes and shipping, and with all those glorious nicks on the front, I figured I could probably convert it into a decent router by installing something like OpenSense. Well, I kind of knew that I could because I came across another listing on eBay for one of these that was marked as an OpenSense router. I didn't necessarily know how easy or difficult that was to do though, and I wanted to try and see if I could mod this unit myself. I also just wanted to take a look at what all is inside and what all this might be able to do. I mean, checking out old gear like this and making videos about it, well, that's probably one of my favorite things about my job as a tech creator. One of my least favorite aspects of being a creator though is the hassle of trying to hunt down the right B-roll, music, sound effects. I can't even begin to imagine how much time I've spent trying to do that. But fortunately, the sponsor of this video, Storyblocks, is making my life as a creator much easier. Whether you're just getting started as a creator or doing it full time, Storyblocks gives you everything you need to tell better stories with assets created by real artists. They offer unlimited downloads of high quality, royal-free content with 4K and HD video, music, sound effects, stock photos, and more, all in one place, which just saves so much time. So often I'll get to the point in a video where I mention plugging something into a router and, well, I could take the time to go grab my camera and some lights and try to film a shot, or I could just hop on Storyblocks, type in router plug, and, well, there we go, easy. Storyblocks is great for finding the perfect shot of a generic data center, or some hard drives, or footage of me trying to figure out why DNS isn't working properly. And they don't just have footage. I was able to pick up this DaVinci Resolve template to quickly create the little typing animation that I do at the top of my videos. Building that from scratch, well, that took way longer than I would like to admit. With Storyblocks though, it just took me a minute or two. And like I said, they've also got a great selection of music and sound effects. This music right now, and all the sound effects in this video came from Storyblocks. And I love that I can get all of that with one simple predictable subscription cost with no hidden fees or anything. So if you want to get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, head to storyblocks.com slash hardwarehaven, or click the link down in the description. The design of the CX570 is pretty simple. On the front, there are a few LEDs, the power button, two USB ports, an RJ45 console port, and then those six gigabit NICs. On the back, there's just a plug for a 12 volt power supply and the power switch. The CX570 comes in this little desktop style case with little feet on the bottom, but it's also designed to be rack mounted. However, it's only half width, meaning it could be perfect for a 10 inch rack if it wasn't such a long boy. And it's long for a reason. On the inside, there's a lot going on. And there's also quite a bit of dust, so hold on one second. That's better. Back on the inside, one of the first things you'll notice are the two two and a half inch drive bays. Mine came with an 80 gigabyte Intel SSD, as well as a 320 gigabyte mechanical hard drive. There's also what appears to be a by eight PCIe slot, but well, it's facing towards the front of the case rather than the back. So we'll have to come back to that. Now, I didn't yet know what CPU was in this thing, but the two gigabyte stick of DDR3 unbuffered ECC memory gave me an idea of just how old it might be. And it's also worth pointing out that there are four dim sockets, which is kind of crazy for a simple network appliance. After taking out this little tray that holds the two and a half inch drives, I also came across this other little board. I had no idea what this was at first. It was plugged in via this socket that I'm not familiar with, 
but after taking a closer look at the board, I finally figured out that it's a lights out module for monitoring the system even when it's powered off. This isn't that useful for me though, as I'm pretty sure you have to use the Riverbed software to configure it. And even if I got it set up, on this specific model, it can't be used to actually control anything. Now, one thing you'll notice that this doesn't have is any sort of display output, but it does have that console port on the front for a serial connection. I hooked up my laptop using a USB adapter, powered the system on, fired up PicoCom, and after realizing that it used a slower baud rate of 9600 rather than 115,200, I was able to access the BIOS menu. Now, I was hoping here to see what the actual CPU model was, but it seems that Riverbed intentionally obfuscated what it was, as it was just showing an Intel Pentium at 2 GHz. I tinkered around for a bit in the BIOS, and there were actually quite a few options here, but I decided to just go ahead and let it boot to see what happened, and as you might expect, it booted into the Riverbed software. Now, I really didn't care about this software because what I really wanted to do was repurpose it and get something else installed like OpenSense. But before that, I wanted to make some upgrades, starting with the fans. Originally, there are two 40 millimeter fans in the back, and well, you can definitely hear them. I decided to swap those out with some of these 40 millimeter 6,000 RPM fans from Arctic. If you buy these individually, they're a little bit cheaper than the Noctua fans, but you can also buy them in a five pack and get a pretty good deal. Other than finding some room for the longer cables, the swap was dead simple, and the noise difference was night and day. Now I could actually hear this little beep when the system posted, and I could also hear these two clicks. We'll come back to what those were in just a second. Next, I swapped out the thermal paste, just because, well, the system is pretty old, but I also swapped out those fans with some lower RPM ones, so I wanted to make sure we were getting as much cooling as possible. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have any spare unbuffered ECC memory available, so I swapped out that two gigabyte stick with just a plain eight gigabyte stick of DDR3L memory, and that worked with no issues. I also swapped out the original drives with two SATA SSDs so that I could start installing OpenSense. Now, fortunately, OpenSense includes a serial installer, which is perfect for a system like this. So I downloaded that and flashed it to a USB drive. Back in the BIOS, I changed the baud rate from the sluggish 9600 up to 115200, and then plugged in the install media and installed OpenSense with no issues. I configured the WAN and LAN ports, got a switch hooked up, and configured OpenSense with no issues. Everything was working great, at least on the first two ports. The last four, however, just had this orange light on and didn't seem to work. All right, do you remember those clicks we heard just a bit ago? Well, those actually came from a bunch of relays that are up at the front of the system that are wired up to those four network interfaces. And this creates what's called a LAN bypass. Because of how the system would originally be installed where it was between the LAN and the WAN, one thing you wouldn't wanna have is the system to crash and then lose your internet access entirely. So how this was designed was that you could hook up your LAN and your WAN connection to these two ports here. And when the system was on and functioning, those relays would actually be shorted to make these network interfaces work. But if the software on this crashed or the system just died, those relays would go back to their original position. So it was almost like this is just working as a coupler. That way if this thing went down, you would still have access to your WAN connection. So in the context of this riverbed network accelerator thing, that works great. But if you're trying to use those four ports as a router and they're just bypassed, it doesn't really work that well. After Googling this, I started to get a little bit nervous because a lot of the solutions I were finding had to do with like finding GPIO pins or literally soldering connections on the board. But fortunately, the CX570 is a model that actually has an option to disable this feature in the BIOS or sort of enable it because the relays have to be on. Anyway, I was able to go into the BIOS, find the setting for the LAN bypass, and after a little bit of tinkering, I was able to find the right settings so that whenever the system powers on, those relays click on and the interfaces all work normally. And so, yeah, at this point, it worked pretty well as just a solid router. I got pretty good results using open speed tests with just a USB adapter on my laptop, and I also got full gigabit up and down when testing with iPerf 3. And with all of that, the CPU usage stayed pretty low. I mean, really the only downside with this was that you are stuck with gigabit interfaces. It is a bit long and kind of awkward and the power usage wasn't great sitting around the high 20s when running OpenSense. However, I did have an idea because I wasn't using that lights out management module. I decided to just try unplugging it and see if the system still worked and it actually booted up faster and that dropped the idle power usage down to like 22 to 23 watts, which really isn't that bad. And I should go ahead and note now while I'm talking about running OpenSense on this, that the CPU in this does support the AES NI instruction set, which can help offload encryption and decryption tasks if you're wanting to run different VPN services with this. However, at this point, I didn't really know what the CPU was still. 
So I was hoping that if I installed a Linux distro, I might be able to find some more answers about that and also just test this thing out a bit more. For this, I ended up just taking a Debian 13 live ISO and modifying it so that it supported serial. I tried out a few different commands like lscpu, but still all I could find was that this was just an Intel Pentium clocked at two gigahertz. So I did some more searching online and I eventually found in a security document that this thing is using, I believe, an Intel Pentium B925C. This is an Ivy Bridge embedded chip from 2013 with two cores and four threads clocked at two gigahertz. It has a TDP of just 15 watts and supports up to 32 gigabytes of DDR3 ECC. And it actually supports dual channel memory, which I wasn't expecting for an old embedded chip. So I added in another eight gigabyte stick of DDR3L so that we'd have 16 gigabytes total in dual channel. I also didn't realize that this was a hyper-threaded chip. And looking in the BIOS, I could see that hyper-threading was in fact disabled. So I enabled that to get our four threads. And then back in Debian, I ran Geekbench. For a bit of context, I grabbed the results from this upsquared board I looked at recently, which has a newer Intel dual core, the N6210, as well as a Raspberry Pi 5. Clearly here, the performance isn't great, but it's definitely still going to be capable of a variety of tasks. Now, especially after enabling hyper-threading, I was a little bit worried about CPU thermals because while well, we also changed out those fans for the 6,000 RPM fans and while well, the system was pretty quiet, so I was kind of worried that we might be cooking the CPU, but after running S2E and a stress test, the thermals were actually pretty good. I don't think I ever saw the package chimps jump above like 50 or 51C. Now, the last thing that I hadn't really checked out was that PCIe slot, the one that was kind of backwards. Now, I think this might've existed for other models in the lineup that used the same board, but had a different chassis. And I think this could have been used with like a riser card so that you could add like more network interfaces up to the front of the system. I didn't have any risers on hand to test this with, at least not any that had more than just one lane. And so I tried using this dual SFE plus card, but well, it was a little bit too big to fit and bumped into the power switch on the back. So instead I dropped in this NVMe adapter, which only uses four lanes, but it was at least able to fit. After running LSPCI, I was pretty surprised to see that this actually supported PCIe Gen 3x4, which is interesting because I believe the CPU only supports PCIe Gen 2, so I guess this would have been a chipset thing. I wish I could confirm whether or not it supported eight lanes of it, but well, regardless, that's pretty cool. Now, I don't really know how you would utilize this all that well because the, the case is already pretty tight and there's not a whole lot of room. Maybe if you took out the LOM board and the SSD caddy, you'd have some room up at the front of the case and maybe you could like mod this thing to have a couple of 10 gig ports or something. That would be pretty cool, but it would also be pretty tricky. But still, this supports PCI Gen 3, which is pretty awesome. I was kind of expecting to come away from this kind of thinking like, oh, cool, there's this thing and you can kind of repurpose it, but it's probably like loud and probably pretty underpowered or something. But in reality, I think for how little money I spent on this, it's pretty solid. I think you'd be hard pressed to find another six port gigabit router with dual SSD slots for like 40 bucks or I guess like 60 after including the, the fan replacements, but still seems like a pretty solid deal. In fact, well, I'll be honest, I'm actually going to be moving here soon and probably redoing a lot of my home lab and network setup. And well, there's not a 0% chance that I might consider making this my next router. I also should point out that it's kind of nice to see that Riverbed designed this system in a way to where, well, it's not easy in some ways to repurpose this, but they didn't like intentionally make it impossible to repurpose this as something else after it's no longer serving as a, a Riverbed steelhead, whatever. So yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. Anyway, I really enjoyed this little adventure and I hope you guys enjoyed this video as well. If you did, maybe consider giving it a thumbs up, maybe consider subscribing, or for as little as a dollar a month, you can help support the channel and also get early access to all of my videos with zero ads, which I think is a pretty good deal. Maybe consider checking it out. That's about it for this one though. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.